You are. Um, I want to invite everybody at this point to go ahead and drop their name and email address in the chat box. Um, and that way, as we have conversations throughout the next um, hour and a half, we'll be able to go back and reach out and contact somebody if we're interested in, in something they're working on. Um, thank you. Um, and, and really just connect and build the, that network. And that is the purpose of Prevention Network is to help build that framework, um, provide the opportunities for us to connect and to learn from one another. So uh, again, my name is Ruth Schwendinger and I get to work with Prevention Network. I'm a program coordinator and right now we're focusing on coalition capacity building. Um, tonight, Joel Hefner is gonna join us and talk about communication plans specifically. So um, we are continuing to make this an entry level process to try to give people the opportunity to gain whatever wisdom they can um, and engage in the capacity building process at whatever level makes sense for them. So we're doing these workshops um, and I'm happy to share with you all that there are McBAP credits available at this point um, for this workshop as well as retroactively back to December. So if you participated in person um, in any of those workshops and would like a certificate for an hour and a half um, or the maximum amount allowable, let me know. Um, we'll follow up with, with some assistance and, and get those certificates to you. Um, so yeah, our main, our main purpose here is to build capacity and that happens at different levels. Um, Joel and I have had this conversation. We started working on a podcast so that the 15 minute conversation about communication and communication planning and what that looks like is available on um, any platform where you listen to podcasts. It's called Prevention Navigators. Um, so you can do a search and find it there. There's also a direct link on our website, which I'm gonna drop in the chat box. While I'm doing that, I wanna give everybody the opportunity to share a name and I'm gonna ask you to share just the first name of someone who impacted you in your work. Why are you doing what you're doing? Um, who is it, um, I'm gonna wait a second for Megan to join us. Who is it that has inspired you to be involved in this work, either positively or negatively? Um, and for me, uh, her name is Holly and it's my mom. So the work that I'm doing is personal and it's relevant um, to what's happening in our families and our communities today. And I still have hope um, that, that she will find a, a safe and, and sober recovery. So, and that's from, from mental illness, from substance misuse, from uh, the destructive behaviors that go along with um, past trauma. So that's my name. And I'm gonna pass it to Brooke. Um, Brooke, and I would like you to introduce yourself Share with us just the name, you don't have to give a whole backstory, of someone who is inspiring you. And then I want you to tag somebody else to introduce themselves. My name is Brooke, and I'm at the Boys and Girls Club of Lenaway. Um, the person that inspires me to do this prevention work, um, her name is Jackie. And Allison, if you would like to take it. Um, well, I'm an intern right now, so I haven't started in the field. Um, but as far as someone who was my mentor and um, inspired me always was my grandfather. He was in a lot of um, coalitions and did a lot of community work as far as environmental policy goes. So. Great. Allison, would uh, you like to talk to somebody? Sure. How about uh, Michelle? Hi, uh, my name is Michelle Shaler and I work for Public Health Delta in Menominee Counties. And the person that inspires me every day with working in prevention is my sister, Jamie. Um, and I guess I will tag Paige. Hi everybody, Paige George, Southline Community Coalition. And I was inspired with from another coalition um, director at an Arcan meeting. I'll go with Kelly. Hey, 
thank you. Um, the person who inspired me the most, and I had to think about it for a couple of minutes because there have been so many wonderful people in my life who have encouraged me uh, and, and sewn into my life. But I think the biggest influence has always been, will be my sister Janelle, uh, my big sister who lost her battle to her substance use issue and her past trauma in 2009. Thank you, Kelly. Would you like to tag Megan? Maurice. I just said I was wondering if somebody was going to call my name. Hello, everybody. I'm Maurice Berry. I'm the director of the Community That Cares Task Force in Albion and owner of Noon and Night Studios. And I've been most influenced to do this type of work uh, by my youngest son, Javon. I can't see any names. Let me see if I can pull some up. I'll just go with who I know is here and choose Wanda. Hello, my name is Wanda Kemp and I am co-director for Kids at Hope. And I have to say that my daughter, her name is Zariah and she has inspired me as well to do this type of work. Um, I'm looking for names. <laughs> did we hear from Paige? We did. So we're we're we can listen to Mara, Addison, Megan, or Joel. Megan, please. Hi, I am Megan. I am with Great Lakes Recovery Program and the coordinator of the Mackinac County Communities That Care. Um, and I think somebody who inspires me in this prevention job is my childhood friend, Jennifer. Um, and I tag Joel. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Joel Hefner. Um, for me, it's really hard to narrow it down to one. I would say the amazing uh, prevention, treatment, and recovery uh, program providers that I've been able to work with for a long time. They have always inspired me to, to try to do better and to uh, learn more about this amazing field and the amazing work we do for folks. So thank you. Uh, how about Mara? Hello, uh, my name is Mara Phillips and I am the project coordinator of the ACT Drug-Free Community Coalition. Um, and I would say my dad uh, probably inspires me the most. He has worked with different coalitions and nonprofits for forever. And he recently celebrated uh, 25 years of sobriety. And I will tag Addison. Addison's unmuting Mara. Where is ACT? Where, is, where are you in Michigan? Um, we're in Dearborn Heights in Inkster. Thanks. Yeah, so hi everyone. My name is Addison. I also work on the ACT Community uh, Drug-Free Community Coalition. Um, I am the communication specialist um, I would say what inspires me most to work this job is I used to be a camp counselor and just working with youth and kids and all that just made me want to like protect them and like the thought of a, like a child uh, kind of going down the wrong path uh, just really like impacted me. So that's why I would like to do this kind of work. Thank you everybody for taking the time to share. I think it's important when we're starting uh, another Zoom meeting this late in the day to, to reconnect with our why, to reconnect with our passion, to reconnect with some inspiration. And I know that that's different for everybody, um, but I recognize that we all have this shared desire to make a difference, to make a change um, because we have hope for the future. And so tonight we're gonna talk about how do we communicate that hope to people? How do we do that in effective ways? and really why it's important to do that as part of a plan, as part of a strategic approach, instead of just being ready at the drop of a hat to um, talk about who we are and why we're doing what we're doing. So I'm gonna turn it over to Joel in a little bit. I, I wanna talk to you first about Tetris, the game of Tetris. Mara's nodding, you know what I'm talking about. Kelly's nodding. Okay, all right, it looks like you're with me. So. Um, I was a, not a demigod, but a Tetris master. And 
uh, back in the day. And it's really all about aligning the pieces to fit the space. So when we're talking about communication planning, I want us to remember an image of Tetris and really think about when we're communicating about prevention needs, we need to know who our audience is, what the key message is for that audience, the delivery method that's most appropriate, the timing, and who is gonna get, deliver that message, okay? So when we're thinking and talking through all of this, um, keep that image in your mind about making sure things align. And then we'll, we'll talk about branding and other things too. But Joel, do you wanna just kinda take it over and then I have a couple of handouts that I can share with people as well, as far as a communications template, um, if you would like. Sure, thanks Ruth. Uh, and really this is, I want this to be, and I think Ruth would agree, as interactive as possible. So if you have questions, comments, uh, you know, stories, um, things that you're dealing with individually as a group or as a coalition or as a leadership team, uh, feel free to throw those in there. Um, because communication is not solely on the staff. I would say communication of a coalition, it wants, you really wanna have everyone empowered to be communicators for your, on behalf of your coalition. So uh, I think for me, as I've, we talked about in our um, podcast is uh, the best coalitions I have personally worked with and uh, been impacted by and facilitated and supported in some way, shape or form are the best communicators. So they do exceptionally well communicating what they do, what the issue is, how to connect to services, how to connect to their activity day in and day out, week in and week out, month in and month out, whatever it may be. So, so for me, I really want people to think about how does your coalition communicate with its membership, with its uh, uh, service providers, so the provider network, the referral network, as we say, and then as well as the, uh, how do you pro, um, provide communication to your community? So there's multiple levels, but again, the most impactful coalitions are amazing communicators. And so, you know, if you, again, thoughts jump out at you, or you're welcome to unmute and share and just be a part of a conversation. That's what I'm hoping for. I actually also wanted to um, bridge this with something that is a part of a training that I have uh, that will be coming up in uh, April and May, uh, Prevention Prepared Communities 101, and there's a 211. I provide this for Michigan Department of Health and Human Services, so MDHHS, as well as with uh, Community Mental Health Association of Michigan. They are the training uh, contractor. But I wanna share this uh, piece with you all um, let me see if I can negate this part here. <clears throat> can everybody see that? If you have to move your, uh, the, the individual pictures of or videos of folks, but this is the things that we have to communicate or we're communicating as coalitions to our uh, committee or to our membership, to our uh, community, to our service providers and professionals that are around the table. And it's exhausting. There's so many things to consider. So what I'm asking you first is, do you, uh, do you provide communication around this or do you provide this type of information within your meetings? And if you don't, maybe just think about a few that stand out or a few that you're uh, not currently or actively promoting or communicating. And then we'll jump into the, the, the essence of a communications plan specifically. But I wanted you to get you the, uh, to have you have the idea of all that we communicate. So coalitions communicate, as I said, referral sources, access to treatment, prevention service uh, information, right? Your program information, uh, your school youth programming, your diversion programming, whatever it may be. You promote and communicate uh, trainings, uh, provider network updates, uh, shifting in, in providers, uh, staff transitions, um, things that are happening with your treatment provider, with your recovery resources, uh, with your prevention programming, your lose staff, transition of staff, 
Um, common, obviously you're communicating to your group, your vision, your goals, your direction. Uh, you're providing an opportunity to network. You're also communicating uh, laws, legislation, policy and advocacy, um, trends in the field. And some of these are, are more common than others, but also partnership opportunities, resource sharing, funding streams, grant opportunities. Uh, I love sharing job opportunities and job openings with my networks because these are the folks that are going to be potential referrals for those jobs or have a, a friend or family member or coworker that are interested in these potential positions. Um, because we're in the helping field, we're usually health and human service oriented uh, professionals and with similar credentials or similar interests. And so job openings uh, are a big deal, especially now with a workforce that's uh, somewhat impacted by the pandemic and by uh, the transition to staff. Uh, we talk about focus and consistency, action oriented and, and measurable, our measurable outcomes are kind of the integral parts of coalitions. But any thoughts on this? Anything stand out to you? Or you maybe didn't think about? Or are they all kind of standard operating for you guys and this is what you try to share monthly? So one of the things I wanted to share about the program opportunities with the coalition capacity building is the, the CADCA Michigan group. So one of the first steps we realized we needed with this program was to create a platform for people to connect because oftentimes we have a prevention workforce that is um, siloed in their own community and working solely on their own, um, trying to get things moving in the right direction. And so well, we partnered with CADCA to create a Michigan community page where everybody in Michigan that already had a CADCA account was automatically added. Um, and there's no cost to join this group. Um, you can go on and it's basically an online forum where we can share library resources, we can share training opportunities, funding opportunities, job opportunities, um, encourage one another, <laughs> right? Just some of that basic um, connection that we all need. So if you haven't joined that community yet, or you haven't looked at it recently, um, I encourage you to go to communities.cadca.org. And that link is also on the, the projects, the C3 project page um, that I dropped in the chat box. So spend some time going through that. I know somebody recently posted a job listing there. And I know we've done trainings. And, and funding opportunities listed there, as well as questions about things like, you know, what's the best vaping training that people are doing right now and things like that in our communities. So. Um, yeah, and, and I would just add to that, that everyone's a resource for everyone. Uh, even though you're maybe new to the field, your expertise, your education, your background, your personal experiences, uh, in prevention, your resource. And so sharing those things with others is really important. And that's really been at the heart of my work. Uh, I've learned from every coalition I've been a part of, either as just a member or as a leader or facilitator or uh, an executive committee member. So uh, that's, that's great stuff. I'd encourage folks to do that. Uh, any of these stand out? Are, are you constantly, because for me, that program information and referral sources is very important. We have so much turnover and transition of staff, new people coming into the coalitions that we need to have this stuff on the table every time, or if it's in person or in, virtually sharing the, these resources, um, program referral information is, is crucial to get people at the table and to get people connected to services because that's at the heart of prevention. But any reaction to any of these uh, uh, listing? of the specific slide. Sorry, Brooke, you're uh, breaking up a little bit. Sorry, um, I was wondering if it would be possible to get a copy of this specific slide because um, it just, um, it's really interesting and is not the experience that I've had on the different coalitions that I've sat on. Um, but I think that this could absolutely be very effective for them. 
I love that. I appreciate that. I can definitely um, uh, get a snippet or get this uh, piece. I will be sharing the, the PPC. This is a part of the Prevention Prepared Communities 201 training. Mm -hmm. And this will be offered through the state of Michigan and uh, for, uh, um, I think, zero cost or low cost uh, through uh, uh, and very soon. Uh, I'll be sharing it with this group as well as um, the networks uh, through Community Mental Health Association of Michigan and MDHHS. So I could definitely get this to you, Ruth uh, or Brooke, and uh, either through Ruth or to yourself directly. Okay, so thank Joel, you. I just took a screenshot. Is it okay I if, I, if I cut that and, and send it to this group of people who've participated tonight? Yep, excellent. I, I was gonna say snippet, but I'm like, I can't do that while I'm talking and- I got it. <laughs> you covered it, thank you so much. So well, what- Oh, sorry. other thoughts? Go ahead. Sorry. Um, no, I was just going to ask Maurice because him and I work on a lot of the same coalitions. And as I'm looking over it, it seems like it's pretty much we cover everything. So I was just going to ask him, was I missing something that on here that we don't just as him doing a double take for me? Uh, I'm going over it right now. <laughs> You know, we do cover. You kind of figure. Yeah. yeah, we cover just about everything, if not everything on here. One uh, of the things I appreciate is the, the trends in the field so that we can connect with people who are monitoring, monitoring the statewide and national trends too um, and communicate yeah. with them on that. Through me, yeah. you, and, and Harry, and, and Miss Davis, yeah, we cover. And Chris, and I, we cover a lot of that. I, I would agree. I think some longer standing coalitions uh, have done a nice job with acclimating to all of these things. And to Ruth's point, uh, vaping programming, evidence based vaping programming for different populations, trends in the field. That's something that I've been, you know, people have been asking and looking for and, find, and trying to find. Once you find it, that's something amazing to share. And, and I've been, you know, I have found a few things uh, and hopefully others have found those things and shared with their networks because it's uh, very valuable. So that's great. I'm glad you um, uh, are aware of those things. Anything else stand out to folks? Kelly, go ahead. Um, so one of the things I'm looking at is uh, the idea of action oriented. And um, <sighs> What I finally did recently with our group um, is I started to create um, subcommittees to work on specific actionable items so that uh, the planning of events um, or programs didn't take up the entire time uh, of our meeting. Um, and then we can go back to the main meeting uh, every month or every other month and report on where we're at with that. Um, I mean, we haven't done a whole, whole heck of a lot, but I just found that it's been so much easier uh, and less complicated um, and easier to disseminate the information. Um, you know, we haven't done um, job openings and I, I actually feel kind of silly now because I, you know, it's such a big issue right now. And we're also short staffed and I know that CMH is, um, yeah as well um it's but, kind of like a checklist it's like if yeah. you can if you have things that are uh relevant and appropriate uh for some of my meetings when when we were in person the, at the front table they sign in and there's all this resource information and access to treatment uh referral information our outreach cards things like that just readily there because we had new members uh, and people show up randomly and and out of the blue and planned so, I mean, these, I think these things are important um, and you can go as far as you want in any one of these, but yeah, there's, there's uh, a lot of um, good reason to, to uh, consider uh, addressing as many as you can. Other thoughts and com under comments on this? And again, just a quick, a, a quick reference point, but the other piece, um, is this follow with me? Are you seeing this slide, the communication plan slide? Okay. Um, so this 
just again gets us back to we have so many things to communicate okay how are we going to do that and for me uh, what i feel like staff need to do is take a step back or two steps back from the coalition specifically and think about uh, the populations that they serve the the different networks that they communicate with and formulate a plan going forward that can be amended adopted uh, enhanced by the next staff, the next staff, or the next coordinator, the next chair, uh, and so on. Because to be honest, the leadership changes and staffing changes roughly average about two to three years uh, with, with prevention specialist staff, with coordinator staff, with uh, coalition leadership or chairs, obviously with bylaws and things like that. Um, and what I have seen is communications plans are an amazing tool and template to ease transitions. If you have an, an existing communication plan, new staff come in, they review, they acclimate themselves to that communication plan, boom, they're off and running. And they can send the emails, they can, um, the, the, the blast emails, they can do Facebook posts, uh, they can uh, do PSAs or continue that path very easily as opposed to some and what happens a lot of cases, they start fresh or they uh, are, are kind of machine gun approaching uh, communication with in, in a variety of different ways. So basically, I would ask uh, just briefly, you know, do you have uh, do, do all of you have communication plans? Are they formalized? Um, because I don't want to go into uh, all these specifics to, to too much of a degree if this is an old hat. Most of us have them, or there's something in place. It's a one pager, it's a half pager, it's a it's a few bullets of what we're uh, interested in around communication. Anybody like to share? Anybody um, new staff or uh, tenured staff have anything to note here as far as communications plans in place, or is this helpful? And we can go through some of the details. <coughs> I don't know if you need to go through, but this is where I struggle. So we're fairly new right before the pandemic. And I just feel like this is where I, I know this is where I'm lacking. Um, and it's a little intimidating to be quite honest. So I appreciate just seeing this. Um, so thank you. No, that's good. And, and for me, this was as well. This was overwhelming for me as, as a coalition coordinator in the past thinking about how do I align these things or uh, are we just, what are we doing really? How are we communicating? Um, is there any pattern? Is there any um, focus? Is there any objective or intended outcome? Or are we just communicating? And that's, I get that, I'm, I felt that. Uh, and that's not uh, something I, I necessarily liked. And that's where we got to forcing ourselves to take some time to take a few steps back it doesn't have to be more than a few meetings or a few um, focused uh, planning meetings to, to flush this out. And where I'd start is the third bullet. So I'll ask all of you, what is the major message and, and um, rele of relevant information you want your community to know? Or what two or three major uh, types of messaging do you want to promote? Are you just st strictly interested in member recruitment and your mission and vision? Because you're brand new. And maybe you want to promote community resources along with member recruitment. And maybe third is you want to promote access to services because that's one of your main functions as a coalition. And I'm talking prevention, treatment, recovery, behavioral health services, you know, primary care services and beyond. I really hope coalitions think about promoting access to behavioral health care as well as potentially physical health care. Uh, uh, sometimes we get into very siloed approaches to promoting access to services, but I come, I'm in a community mental health authority. We're a behavioral health uh, safety net. We provide substance use disorder, prevention, treatment, recovery, as well as mental illness uh, services for the mentally ill, intellectually developmentally disabled folks, and beyond. So it's 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 something where I think coalitions can consider um, promoting access 
to prevention, treatment, and recovery services. I hope that's a part of uh, the thinking as well. So again, what is your major type of message? And then what I see is the advanced coalition, some of the ones that are further along, well, they do those things. They promote services, community resources, and all along promote coalition member recruitment or bringing on new members. But they also get to data, uh, data and action reports, uh, needs assessments, whatever it may be, um, publications, annual reports, things like that, um, or just simple publications that can be very brief and prevention tips and other messaging, um, social media marketing, messaging, things like that. Uh, so what do folks, any, any, any thoughts on the types of messaging? Can anybody give us, give us an example of what you focus on with your messages currently? I think I'll go. Uh, currently, my primary focus right now, aside from youth prevention, is homelessness and uh, substance abuse treatment. I worked on the uh, harm reduction grant and was a Narcon distributor in the community. And the grant ended last month, but the, the services still carry on and I'm still being contacted. So those would probably be my two primary function. And I'm sure Wanda has some that she focuses on as well. And Maurice, you would say that's promoting access to services and your community resources around homelessness, Narcan, things like that? Absolutely. Excellent. Wanda, anything to add there? Sorry, I was trying to come off on, on mute. Um, also uh, working with the youth, um, and we have been dealing with the promotion of um, vaping. So we've been dealing with um, drug prevention and um, the data of the change, the, the changes with that comes with that, as far as how many we've been able to start off with knowing that's actually vaping compared to the drop, the numbers of risk that drop when the numbers drop. And then at risk behavior as well, because we've been having um, mental health when I say at risk. Sure. So we've been um, also working with that with our youth. And I would put those in a category of prevention tips. So you're providing prevention messaging around um, mental health, around um, uh, those issues specifically. And, that, and that's great. Other thoughts? Other no, I don't. I've talked recently with Megan about what she's doing with communication. Um, Paige has a plan in place that she is going to start implementing soon. And I'm wondering about, don't, don't make that face, you are. Um, and I'm wondering about Addison and Brooke and where, where do you stand with communication planning with the Boys and Girls Club? What's going on right now with your local conditions that you're seeing? Do you have a communications plan? Um, how do you communicate when you need to? And, what are you focused on right now? With, with regards to the Boys and Girls Club, um, it's, it's not an easy question to answer because um, though we are a part of the Boys and Girls Club, our program is kind of its own separate entity. Um, and so with that being said, the Boys and Girls Club is incredibly supportive of what we do. Um, and so they will put out messaging um, about our specific program. Um, but as far as like what we do individually, um, we've been struggling a bit with the communication um, piece and kind of getting it out to people. Um, we've done, um, different ways, different things to try to engage, um, but the communication piece has been a little bit difficult um, as, as far as kind of like getting a, a conversation going. Um, and we do work with local um, coalitions and 
um, you know, we're a part of those coalitions. Um, but it's, it's just, it's been a little challenging for us. And that would be the within the delivery methods bullet, the fourth bullet there. Um, maybe other folks can help and just offer up additional ideas because this is just the start of this. Um, the different mechanisms for communication are endless. What I see the most are emails, newsletters, PSAs, press releases specifically, billboards, Facebook, uh, TikTok, uh, media outlets specifically. It could be uh, TV or radio, um, but there's more. There, there's podcasts. There's different things that are, um, you know, growing. Is there any other thoughts to different um, delivery methods that people can share that they utilize locally? Go ahead, Paige. I was on a meeting earlier today and we were talking about communication <laughs> and someone mentioned they had asked their parents, how do they want to get the message? And it was interesting that a number of them had come back, different coalitions had replied that parents are tired of the emails, they're tired of reading things, but what they would like is something that they can listen to, like an audio so whether what I know one coalition talked about putting out some kind of flyer or postcard and on there, it'd be a little um, code and they could just click on it and it just takes them right to a pre-recorded message about whatever. So I love it. I don't do it, but it sounded great. <laughs> I mean, again, I another, I venue, <laughs> another method, another mechanism, and that's great uh, to get that feedback. I think that may be a part of it, Brooke, where you're, um, uh, what is your population that you're trying to connect with? If it's professional level staff, uh, networks, referrals, or is it community, neighborhood, family? That's a different level. And I would say the method and the mechanism different for each one of those groups and populations. So you're doing a communications plan right now just in talking about this. And just like Paige is talking about uh, focus group and finding out a better delivery method, you're digging deeper in, de in defining your communication plan. That's that's excellent. Uh, Addison, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, I just wanted to say and like touch on that point that you just made about kind of uh, changing your delivery methods for different audiences. Um, so we have a few social media pages, but we mostly focus our Facebook on parents and then we focus our Instagram and our TikTok more towards youth. And I think that's really important because parents, you know, are more likely to actually sit and listen and be interested in this stuff where for youth, it's more important to show like visual effects, um, like visual dangers of the drugs or like we posted something where it was like it showed the deadly amount of fentanyl that's just like a few little grams like that's something that's really impactful and it only takes them a few seconds to process because kids do have short attention spans and everyone is so busy nowadays that we need to really utilize um like visual media as well so well i love it thank you so much addison that's that's an excellent point uh for personal experience our community my communications department is uh establishing a TikTok and an instagram just for our youth. Like we're not utilizing that. We're not utilizing and building that for our, our uh, adult population. We're doing that specifically for the young adults and, and youth in our uh, Tri-County area and beyond. So that it's a great example. It's a great uh, point about um, uh, different mechanisms and mediums for specific audiences. And I think TikTok is a perfect one that really needs to be utilized and considered as you, as you grow. Uh, for uh, our youth or younger populations. Other thoughts? That's great. And I think this is how people need to navigate the communications planning uh, idea and not get overwhelmed with it because I can, you know, I could really, you know, ask each one of you. And, and again, this is where I'm available for emails and things like that. And Ruth and I will talk about this more, but, and she, Ruth is available. You can ask us questions about anything specifically, and we can walk you through our suggestions and our recommendations about uh, creating your communications plan. So uh, we can help you 
actually uh, uh, complete one. Um, I can do that um, very easily and, and assist as, as needed. You may have the types of messaging that you want, like you're gonna promote access to services and your programs, you're gonna uh, promote community resources and prevention tips around vaping and underage drinking or whatever else. But then you're, and you know your audiences are these people, um, you have these certain delivery methods and you have this capacity uh, around how much you can promote or how much time you can and energy you can put into this. And you have the staffing available that you know, a responsible party. I can help you with additional methods or, or mechanisms to consider. I can help you with flushing out objectives and int or intended long-term outcomes. And it's just good to have because if you're communicating with your coalition or you're uh, reporting to a formal board or county commission or uh, if you if you uh, are reporting to your county collaborative uh, or your agency's board of directors or however you communicate your coalition's efforts, they'd love this stuff. I mean, this really would um, go a long way with uh, sharing your effectiveness as a coalition. This is our communications plan. This is what we're communicating with. This is what we're uh, sharing. And you'll hopefully you're seeing these things too in PSAs or uh, in, on Facebook or whatever else. Other thoughts to these uh, bullets, these areas? So I actually just finished up today a meeting with my data group and we didn't we weren't quite as formal, but I think utilizing a communication plan for how we're going to communicate all of our data that we've just received. Um, and our main focus right now is targeting our um, school boards because we our county serves five different schools. So we've got five different school boards that were in our schools and we're trying to get more communication through them. So um, I think that utilizing something like that would be beneficial for us. Great, I'm so glad you said that, Megan, because you just provided a great example of a singular focus area like data or what I, my, my term is data in action reports that you can share with the population or general population um, and move the needle. So you're moving the understanding, the comprehension, the willingness to support your efforts to maybe make some policy changes with data. And with school boards, that's a perfect example of how to uh, flush out your your understanding your audience and your objective with that group, the types of messaging you want to promote, the delivery, and so on. So I, I for me, um, I was a part of really bringing data and action reports in like 2008, 2006, 2008. Um, to the to the really the forefront of coalitions uh, work in, in in the prevention arena. So we were able to work with um, Eaton Behavioral Health and uh, the Barry Eaton District Health Department, and they were able to give us epidemiologist staff and data staff, and we really made that into something that uh, they've done uh, some amazing things with their data and action and their coalition uh, uh, activities. One of the things that Wanda said earlier, and it echoed with me when Megan was talking just now, because it was also brought up by one of our, our grant review team members when we were looking at projects and figuring out what was gonna be funded and what wasn't. When you're sharing the data, we wanna celebrate the successes as well as recognize those target areas that need more attention. And so um, data is one of those things that oftentimes needs to be interpreted for people um, and when we do that, we need to do that in ways that are um, non-stigmatizing, that encourage people to get connected to the sports that they need. Um, but also, I just wanted to, to include that little nugget that I've picked up from a couple of you tonight and, and echoed from experts for, that I've talked with before about when you're communicating the data, do it in ways that empowers people. Um, and include the positive successes as well as those those target areas for the future. Yeah, Ruth, that's what came to mind right when you said that, and I love these things, are infographics. Infographics are able to translate data, symbols, action, uh, concern, problem area 
into a beautiful uh, image. And we utilize that a ton at Community Mental Authority Clinton Eatening uh, in my work. And um, I've, you have to know that not, you know, all these SAMHSA, uh, CDC, um, uh, amazing groups, NAMI on the mental illness side, they utilize uh, AFSP for in the suicide prevention arena. They utilize infographics in, in a such a higher level way than I've ever seen. And my work with the data work group at the state of Michigan, infographics are an amazing tool to uh, share and promote general messaging around problem areas and data. Canva is a great tool for creating infographics because it's free, right? Excellent. Well, say it again, maybe put that in chat. What was yep. it? I will, I will get the direct link and put it in the chat. It's Canva. Yeah, Canva. Yep. I love Canva. I'm, I'm a big fan. Uh, Kelly, any additional thought? Well, just as uh, I raised my hand, Ruth mentioned Canva, uh, but my comment or question really was, um, you know, I have like four, four different Facebook pages or three, sorry, that now that I um, manage or work on. And I share a lot of other people's infographics and try yes. to make comments on them but I'm not real skilled at like creating my own. Um, and do you think that the ones that we share are maybe less impactful? Um, if, it's, if they're from reputable sources, I would yes. support that because we do the same. Yeah. And I'd say okay. to other, other question or the other comment about um, your capacity individually to create them. I wouldn't worry about that. That, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I would connect with some epidemiological staff in your area, a, a data specialist at a health department, your um, community data uh, uh, staff at a, at a health department or a university. Um, and maybe I can assist with getting it connected with some folks um, at the state level that are assisting coalitions and in, in creating data reports and data uh, infographics. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah it, there's uh, there's some great work being done uh, at the state level. Um, and I work with the state epi outcomes work group uh, as the chair and the amazing staff that are around the prescription opioid issue right now mm -hmm. and the data um, that's coming out of of a specific epidemiological group uh, or department is impressive. And they do offer assistance to coalition. So, um, Feel free to reach out to me. I'll get you that contact. That's a Thank great you. point. A lot of people don't realize that you don't have to create these things yourself. There are people at the state level who are working to support you in what you're doing. So I just saw Wanda's hand is up too. Oh, I was just going to say that would be interesting to learn. But even when I look at, listen to what you just said, I'm like, well, work that resource instead. <laughs> right, right. I like what Allison said too. If you can get an intern or a potential um, university uh, class connection um, with, with uh, some um, uh, undergraduates that would be interested in, in doing a project like that. But I think internships uh, and co-ops and field studies, I work with uh, interns from CMU, uh, I present for them and, and do a lot of work with CMU. So that's, that's a great point. Uh, and, and free labor. I wish I could pay them. I give them as much as I can. And in other, uh, you know, other resource, I get them trained and uh, a few thousand dollars in training, which is which is what I can provide for their time and efforts. Uh, and what I uh, MODA is the group uh, at the state level. Um, it's the Michigan Opioid Data Outcomes. Um, so and I'll, and I'll get started with prevention network and it's a Michigan opioid data to action. Data to action. Yeah, that's right. Thank you. And Brooke included a, a good resource um, with the PTTC about the five C's, not D's of data. And a lot of the, the trainings available about data are available on the PTTC network. Um, so I encourage you if you don't already attend and don't get their regular newsletters and their updates, sign up for that. Um, and I did include that in the last um, email blast with the C3 program information um, because they have some specific culturally competent um, capacity building trainings coming up in the next couple of weeks as well. Um, 
I do want to revisit, and Joel, I'm not um, we didn't go over your outline tonight, but uh, I trust you. I do want to go over a little bit more in detail about responsible parties and, and how when we're talking about engaging and um, identifying responsible parties for specific parts of our communication plan, how that needs to be built on trust. Um, because different groups of people have different sources they go to that they trust and um, that they like to hear from, that they will listen to. Because oftentimes if I walk into a high school and I start spouting data, nobody's gonna listen, right? They're not even gonna know I'm there. Um, but if I walk into like a county commissioner's meeting and say, thank you for, this is what your funds are supporting, here's the data to back it up. That's where, that's where I'm listening to. So when we're talking about communication plans, and specifically the who is delivering the messages. Um, I think that's important. And I wonder if, if we can talk about that just a little bit more and what people's experiences are with establishing trust and identifying who in your community is a trusted source of information. So let's, let's take a, who, Let's see, Michelle, you haven't um, been able to, to share much today. Who are you targeting with, with information right now or communication? Not just straight information, but who are you targeting right now? So that is a tough one for me. I'm, I'm not the coalition uh, facilitator. I just sit on the coalition. Um, so most of my work is actually with students. So to answer that question for me, I would say I work with the teachers that have already built the relationship with those students. And I think I would take that in terms of the coalition and do the same as find out who my audience is and who does that audience respect. And that's who I would, who I would ask to share that message. Yeah, but I can't think of a specific example. <laughs> okay. Now, a lot of times we'll, we'll be a, person working in prevention and will we'll say, well, we should get law enforcement involved. I'll go talk to the chief of police. And I'm walking in off the street and they don't know me from Adam. How is that gonna work? I need to go to somebody that they know and trust and, and get them on board and then um, bring that message there. Wanda. Um, for us, it has been the school board because of dealing with youth and school issues with um, the youth. So it's been the school board and the schools, the staff at the school. Um, and it's very true what you said, because as far as bringing in and pulling in the correct people, because with the groups that we have for our coalition, it's different coalition groups for different issues. We also target um, Summit Point, because that's dealing with our mental health portion. So we have a mental health task force. So it's just depending on who we're actually, what target group of tar people we are trying to target, what group we pull in to work on that task force and that committee to establish what we need to get out and to our audience, our targeted audience. Sometimes the right person for the job doesn't know how to communicate very well. And so um, like if we want our youth to go present at the school board and say, hey, can you go talk about this program that we just did? And they're like, uh, yeah, sure, I guess. And they don't know what to say. And they just walked in and say, yeah, it was all right. That's not going to communicate effectively what we're trying to do. So oftentimes we need to offer people the opportunity to develop the message themselves so they can take ownership of it, so they can express that passion they have, so they can express the impact it's had on their lives. Um, and so it's not just um, knowing the information, finding the person and, and connecting them to your target audience in the right way or for the right time span. It's also about intentionally involving people in helping them make the message their own. Yeah. Because the more you empower other people, the less weight there is on your shoulders, the less likely you are to burn out. And my purpose is to support you and I wanna support you supporting others. So um, that's all I wanted to say on that is let's, let's help 
equip people to carry on the work in the future. Yeah, and I, I think, Ruth, that's uh, the key to action plans in my mind and communication plans and having, and again, when I say plans, it doesn't have to be five pages, 10 pages. It can be a one pager, it can be a half page. Uh, it doesn't have to be some, something uh, so insurmountable, nobody touches it or it sits on a, on a shelf. I, that's not my, my way of supporting action-oriented coalitions or coalitions that are effective in, in communications. So really, uh, I, for me, the greatest part of, of my work in coalition, so I, I facilitate a behavioral health council, and it's tri-county, so it's three counties. And when I have my uh, some of the members, just general membership, promoting and communicating the Behavioral Health Council on my behalf, on our behalf, to the Mayor's Mental Health Task Force, uh, it, it worked, it's just beautiful. It's like, that. that's exactly what I was hoping for because I don't have that connection or I didn't have that connection. And uh, that staff, that member uh, established it by sharing, uh, by understanding our, our messaging our intent, our mission, our vision, and was able to share that with another group. They pulled me in. I was able to share our action plan and our, our, our uh, activities. And now those groups are aligned and connected in more ways than, you know, than ever. So it's, it's about empowering others to share the message. Well, to understand it first and foremost, bring it to them uh, and own it themselves and share it with others. And then it, again, it really alleviates the burden so much on coalition staff and coordinators and leadership. Uh, and it really feels good. I, I recognize too, that it takes more time to train somebody else to develop their own message than it does to just do it yourself. Um, even if you have to learn how to create infographics on Canva, it still takes more time to train somebody else, right? And so when we're talking about this, we really need to do this with a mind towards sustainability and toward the future. You don't want everyone to be dependent on you for everything. Right. And so it really is about using the tools and using the structure and using a plan rather than um, just saying, okay, in my head, this is what I'm going to do, but I don't have to communicate that to anybody else in the coalition or within this group, because I know I'm going to be the one doing all the work. So we have this, this tool from the PTTC that we can use. And Wanda, I don't want to skip over this. Your hand's still up. I don't know if that's incidental or if you had something else to add. Okay. I didn't, I just didn't want to, I didn't want to ignore you with your, with your hand up there. Um, and this, this outlines all of those things that Joel was talking about, because um, the audience, we need to ask ourselves these questions. We need to develop that key message. We need to have a clear delivery method with timing, um, not just I need to call and talk to them or visit their office when they're not busy, but duration. How often am I going to repeat this message to this individual, to this group of people? Because we cannot give people a message once and expect it to stick. We have to keep coming back and keep bringing the relevant information to them. And so as we're shaping in these messages with a specific audience, we need to know what's important to that audience and not just who they trust, but what's important to them. Um, so this is just a simple, simple communication plan that anybody can use and fill out. You can make it work for yourself. Um, you can download this on the PTTC website. I'll include it and add it to our Michigan CADCA forum community library. Incredibly simple. Our goals, um, our audience with a key message, delivery method, a responsible person and timing. There's also a filled out sample version of this that we can share, right? So if we're looking for people to um, increase participation in the youth coalition or whatever it is that we're doing, who are we going to target? What information is most relevant to them? And all of that is data. And some of the data is qualitative, some of it's quantitative, some of that's personal stories, that's still relevant data. Um, oftentimes when we have a person with lived experience sharing their story um, on an individual level, as well as um, 
the population level data that we can share, um, it's going to have the biggest impact when we use a variety of communication methods. The delivery method and then the responsible people. So it's just a couple of tools that we can use to really take a look at building this out into a, a clear communication plan. Uh, when Joel and I were talking, we talked a little bit about uh, how frequently coalitions should look at developing and revamping a communications plan. Because in my experience, um, one of the things we did was we put together a communication plan just before we launched a media campaign. That was the only time we did a communications plan was, okay, well, we're putting all this money into a media campaign. How are we going to make sure it's effective? Um, and then we would plan intentionally about that. And that's a terrible way of doing it. So Joel recommended once a year, annual annual best practice, something like if, that. If possible, once a year, I could consider uh, two, two times or every two years because of transition or um, uh, any changes in funding or uh, um, objectives, goals or objectives or strategies or funding. Because sometimes it's the, uh, the funder that dictates like DFC or others, some shift in programming. So one to two years is fine. When we're doing that, we're always gonna be sharing different information in a slightly different way because if we're repeating ourselves with the same logo, the same images, the same stories, the same names, people are gonna lose interest. But we do wanna tweak it every once in a while. And yet with all of that, in our game of Tetris, right? We're being consistent in our vision, in our mission, and who we are. So when we start communicating, people automatically know what we're going to be talking about, but they're looking for new information. They're looking for motivation, right? So when, whenever we're giving people information, we need to offer them the opportunity to engage. Um, yeah, an action. I like right? connect it to an action, right? Connect it to an action more than scanning a code and saying visit our website usually, right? Um, but it has to be entry level stuff. We have to offer people different ways to engage because I can't tell you how many times I've been at an event and somebody walks up to me and says, this is great. How can I get involved? And I, I said, initially, when I was just starting out, I'd say, we'll come to a coalition meeting. Figure out what's going on and get connected. Nobody comes to coalition meetings when they're first invited. Not nobody, but very few. And so we need different opportunities for people to get engaged. Have a sign-up sheet when you go out to events um, for people to get added to your contacts list. Ask them if they'd be willing to show up early at the next farmer's market and help you set up your booth so you can just have that conversation and develop more of a relationship, a little more buy-in. Um, involve the youth in figuring out if they'd be interested in being a peer mentor, right? Talking about those relationships that people trust, let's work on developing people with the skills and knowledge that they need to be effective communicators. Well, I really like Ruth, how we went through and kind of walked through uh, all the steps of the communications plan and had dialogue on each one specifically and kind of uh, flush those out. Is there are there other questions from folks that just uh, are resonating or, or uh, again, you can follow up after, but we have a few more minutes. I can touch on branding for a minute or really quickly and because uh, that's a, a little bit deeper dive uh, into this, but are there other thoughts or questions on those steps? I just want to take a second for self-care because we've been on for an hour. So I just want to encourage everybody to take a deep breath. Roll your shoulders back, look up, looking around a little bit, um, and let's uh, let's re-engage because it is five o'clock on a Wednesday night. So I acknowledge that. I recognize it's been a long week for some of us already, um, but do keep doing that deep breathing. Do a couple of those stretches, right? I'm just looking at Brooks' hammock and being very jealous. <laughs> um, well, I saw Kelly nodding when we, you asked about branding. Um, and we can certainly come back to things, but let's talk a little bit about that image that we're portraying to the community around us. 
for sure. Let me pull this up really quick because I've been working on this and adding to it a little bit. So again, uh, in, two, in the PPC 201, Prevention Prepared Communities 201, uh, it's called Building and, and Sustaining an Effective Community Coalition. That's the title of the training. It's a full day. Uh, it's a workshop. And what I'm uh, really interested in and, and invested in is having uh, um, folks that participate come away with very practical, very uh, um, relevant tools for their coalition. So they work in small groups, they work in groups from who, uh, where they came from, if they have a, a group of staff or leaders, but they come away with some practical application tools to improve their coalition action-oriented agendas, annual outcome evaluation uh, templates, um, uh, uh, partnership, uh, um, ideas on additional partnerships, uh, brand and communication plans, things like that. So really briefly, what is a brand? What is a brand identity? What is brand identity and why is it important? Um, for me, we have to think about, we are a business in a sense. We uh, Coalitions are uh, an entity, an agency. If you're a 501c3, you're a nonprofit, you're a, you're a part of, or a, an offset of the health department or the, the community mental health authority or the prevention uh, provider. So the coalition in itself can identify a brand uh, with their logo or symbol or designs, um, their tagline or name, whatever it may be. But a brand is a feature or set of features that is distinguish one organization or entity from another, one coalition from another coalition. A brand identity is made up of what your brand says, what your values are, and how you communicate your product, and in this case, services, uh, uh, and what you want people to feel when they interact with your company, your agency, your association, your coalition. Um, and essentially your brand identity is the personality of your business or agency or coalition and a promise to your customers, consumers, um, catchment area, population, whatever you want to want to think about that. So for me, um, I've seen, you know, you have high level coalitions like the WHO, uh, World Health Organization, or American Cancer Society, American um, uh, Medical Society. I mean, there's just so many different ones that are at high levels, uh, and they've established a brand. Uh, and then there's others in the state of Michigan that have established a brand. Uh, anyone have heard of uh, uh, Kevin Song? That's uh, a, a kind of a coalition or network that's on the suicide prevention arena. Um, there's several county substance use uh, coalitions uh, that have a brand. Uh, the Muskegon area has a, a, an amazing brand a network uh, or in Grand Rapids area, Kent County area, um, Detroit Wayne, uh, there's many, many coalitions, McCrud, Michigan Coalition for Underage uh, Redu Reduction of Underage Drinking, um, Prevention Network, uh, or the, um, excuse me, the Michigan Prevention Association, MPA, they have their brand. And that is what I'm hoping for all coalitions to establish a brand for themselves. And that goes along with your logo and your vision, mission, things like that, being connected and people being, and it being known in your community. Why I say this is for this reason, brand saturation or saturation of message. So the brand is the house uh, and it's, you know, building the foundations and the structure of your coalition. But then in order to have your messages truly saturate, that's when you're communicating at such a high level that a good, I call it minority to start, then majority as it grows of the community population are aware of your efforts. I've been on coalitions for many years and then we'd go to a, a county commission, we'd go to um, a, an event or we'd be a part of something and people would say, well, who are you? What are you? What do you do? Uh, or they were professionals in our arena and still were not aware of our activity and that's fine that happens all the time 
it's not easy to get uh, this messaging and this information out to all the different staff and all the different uh, agencies in large areas or even small areas, rural areas. But what I'm saying is think about it as saturation of messaging is important and it's very important in prevention because what are we trying to do? We're trying to reduce the risks, increase protective factors around individuals, families, and populations. And in order to do that, we have to have people aware of services, supports, resources, messaging, tips, uh, and so on. So it's, it's uh, communication and messaging is huge in prevention. Um, it's just a, a basic fabric of what we need to do. We need to have people aware of how to get to services because they can't connect to um, our, our uh, information and resources if they're not aware of us. You can't help a family if they're not connected. Go ahead. Sorry. No, I just, I was, I was thinking about this because a lot of times if, if we're joining an organization that has been around forever, if we're, if we're part of the health department or something like that, CMH, we don't often recognize that there have been instances historically, repeatedly, where people have been, um, have been treated very poorly. And so if we are relying on the brand of our agency, we need to make sure that that brand stands for what we stand for and, and recognize the historical impact of um, discrimination, of um, stigma, of judgment, of um, just kind of demoralizing people based on their, their health status. And so when we're talking about brand, it's important to recognize too that we cannot depend on our current good name. We cannot depend on the current good nature of our health departments, our, our CMHs, because historically we don't have a good relationship with the people in our communities. We certainly are working on changing that, but it's important to create your own brand and not rely on those that are your partners. That's, that's, that's just what I wanted to say is to recognize that just because you've had a good experience historically with your doctor doesn't mean everybody's had that same experience. And this is your opportunity to create a brand for your coalition and, and you know, connected to, to positive messaging. And that's great. I, I appreciate that, Ruth. Are there any thoughts? Because that's really all I had for, for and I just want to take questions or kind of uh, let the uh, discussion go from there. But is there questions or you know, clarification on, on this item specifically. Because for me, um, I would say what I've been working on with our community mental health authority uh, at, at CEI um, has been a rebranding. Uh, what Ruth said hit nail on the head for us. We were, uh, um, we are still in some realms, but I think it's much, much less over the past five to eight years. Um, but we were considered a uh, inflexible, um, uh, impenetrable service system that um, you know is only for those other folks. And the majority of individuals that were in need for a mental health issue or a uh, uh, whether they thought it was severe, persistently mentally ill, or a mild to moderate uh, mental illness, uh, they were not able to access our services. And Kelly feels it, I'm sure, and, and other CMHs across the state, that's kind of the, the general realm, the general thought. Um, and I'm on this, I've been on this SUD side, but I was obviously a, uh, a funding authority, a regional authority, and would, was part of overseeing the CMHs and the provider networks. So I knew that very well and uh, felt that very well with how our referral networks were um, interacting with CMHs and just the inability to get people into care. So, because they either didn't meet eligibility, they weren't Medicaid, whatever else. So now there's a lot of opportunity there for the uh, certified uh, community behavioral health clinics, the CCBHCs, and uh, the flexibility of their funding and opening up their doors a little bit more. But now we have staff shortages, so I won't go into all of that. 
Um, but definitely a perception issue, a brand issue, mm -hmm. and something I was tasked to change. So Kelly, go ahead. Well, I was just going to uh, kind of piggyback on that about the perceptions is one of the perceptions that we have really had to struggle against was that, um, you know, not only do we not really serve the whole county, but only certain people, but that we're just like flush with money. And so we, we, we should never have to ask that is that lack of understanding that our funds and it's like a traditional CMH is not a CCBHC is even more strict than a CCBHC and we're still working on getting our CCBHC. So it's this perception among, um, you know, the community and even uh, partner organizations that, you know, we just have this huge budget and we have all this money to spend and we should be doing more and carrying more. And that's made some things a little bit challenging. Right. For the and, and I think this is a good example. We're talking about CMHs and branding. Yeah. Rebranding. Re your coalition is no different. You're dealing with one of the mm -hmm. most stigmatized issues in the planet, uh, substance use yeah. disorder. <laughs> and the things that you're dealing with, with what, how people uh, react and think that I could you know, support that coalition or I need to be aware of that issue or I need to be uh, um, understanding of substance use disorder issues. You're dealing with the same things and branding is a part of crafting a message so people understand what I say is behavioral health happens to everyone. And what I think it, it relates to substance use disorder impacts everyone, families, peers, networks, you know, coworkers, whatever. So that, that's the connection there. I, I think there's a thought or a question that uh, someone had. Um, Mara, Mara, go ahead I, uh, on branding question dilemma for our coalition. Yeah, this is just something that we've been uh, talking about for the last couple months especially but um, so our coalition has a fiscal agent and our fiscal agent has been in the community for 30 plus years and is uh, well respected and people know who it is but people don't know who the coalition is and so we've been trying to balance you know creating our own brand as the coalition um, but a lot of times people will come to our events or come to programming and say oh this is you know, this is an LAHC program, which is our fiscal agent, um, which is not necessarily a bad thing because people uh, like LAHC and like the um, like us in the community. But we are also trying to differentiate because the services are different. Um, like you know, someone said before, coalitions serve a very specific area, um, and so we're just trying to kind of navigate creating our own brand while also kind of maintaining the relationships we have as the fiscal agent, if that makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. I, I would just put this out there and others can throw their ideas too. Um, I would, that's a great opportunity because you can um, utilize their positive brand and connect it with your brand that you're establishing, or you could, as the secondary option, uh, kind of separate. My thought is kind of the co-branding where We've done this internally. We've done this externally with some of the networks. So uh, the Capra Health Alliance is an umbrella uh, association in the Tri-County area in, in Lansing area. And I have the Behavioral Health Council that was a part of that, an outgrowth of that uh, as, a, as a kind of a committee or a, a, a task force. So we, we had established a co-brand with the Capra Health Alliance. They put us on their website. It's a, it's a slash. So the agendas, the um, publications, the action plan had a slash. So it's their logo, our logo, but there's a line uh, and it's a nice co-branded. It looks really good. I do that also with MASP, AFSP, uh, the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, MASP, Michigan Associate. So there's a lot of ways to co-brand and connect, but then have a definitive line. And that's where you uh, establish your own with that linkage. Ruth, other thoughts? Any, anyone else? Uh, I think that's a great opportunity for some co-branding. Yep. And so what you do is you establish an understanding of this is how you will share our coalition initiatives, functions, activity. It's a separate tab in their website. It's a, it's a formalized um, 
uh, or defined realm. If it's a tab on a website, if it's your own website with the co-branded theme, um, if it's within publications and, and promotion, I think that's great. I, but I would um, uh, consider the connectivity of that and because it's such a positive. If it wasn't, then I would be definitely thinking about breaking away and establishing a separate identity. Does that help? Yeah. Yes, thank you, absolutely. Yeah, and, you're, and their logo carries weight. It carries uh, respect. It carries uh, the value. All, you, what you're doing is with co-branding, your, your, your value added. And that's, that's excellent. And that's a partnership. That's a, that's a, and they should benefit and they will appreciate that as well because you're giving the, the new networks that you're establishing only support their work and enhance their, um, their brand and their brand identity. So that's excellent. That's I a two-way two benefit right there. That's great. Sorry, go ahead, Ruth. I just have one other, one other point. Um, and maybe we can wrap up with this last thought and, and kind of let it marinate in our brains for a while. Um, none of this matters if our mission is not focused, if we're not clear on what we're communicating to people. And I see a, a lot of my colleagues here have um, corrective lenses. You ever sit in the optometrist chair and you're, you're going through the, the flipping process where he's testing your vision and saying, he or she's testing your vision and saying, you know, which one's better, one or two. And then all of a sudden something clicks and everything lines up and you can see 2020. If we are not clear with every member of our coalition, every partner, every referral source that we are communicating with about our mission, um, then we're, we're, we're adding confusion to what we're talking about. Um, we're making it more difficult for them to pass on the message that we're asking them to share with their people. And so everything we do has to fit into that Tetris image, right? It has to be focused. It has to be zeroed in on our mission. Um, it doesn't matter if we're asking for dollars for housing. It doesn't matter if we're asking for volunteers at a PTO event. It needs to be focused and viewed through that lens of our mission. Joel? I think 4D was my clarity in uh, at the optometrist. I, I have contacts it, so I've, I'm with you. My glasses are upstairs. Right. But that's a great point for sure. Um, so I know Allison is our um, currently working with us as our intern, and she's been working with us on clarifying um, kind of how we're going to approach the next stages with Prevention Network, and and when we're talking about mission vision. All of that is based on our values. And I would just encourage you to look around your, your colleagues and recognize that you have shared values. And when you're looking to branch out and make community partners, identify those shared values. For me, my biggest number one purpose in life is to share hope. There is hope for the future, right? That is my number one value, honesty, integrity, hard work, right? So when we're talking about, um, our values and you're looking at branching out and, and building your coalitions and building your organizations, find those shared values and make that your selling point when you're building partnerships. And so I wonder if, if anybody has identified or if you've gone through this process recently, what are maybe just one of your values as an individual that matches with your coalition or your organization? And I'm, I'm going to ask Allison to go first because I want everybody else to have a minute to think about it because you, you've been doing this for a while, but what is one of your shared values? Um, well, I guess I would say our value statement for French and Network, which is a life free of substance use or life free of the consequences of substance use disorder. And I just... I guess that actually hits home for me. I really like that language and um, it's something that I value also, that freedom of substance use. That, that freedom from the consequences of substance use. Absolutely. I love that. Thank you for sharing. Addison. Our coalition focuses on bilingual messaging because we have a very diverse population um, and a lot of the people that we're trying to reach speak Arabic. 
Um, and I really like that we take the time to reach out to individuals, um, you know, who might need slightly different messaging. So I like that the diversity aspect is uh, considered. Excellent. Thank you for sharing that. Is there anybody else that would like to share? I know mine has always been uh, accountability. I put that on myself and, and I think for the coalitions I've been a part of or, or uh, helped uh, lead uh, accountability to our population, to our community, to our uh, membership uh, is, is a big deal. Thank you. Yeah, it is huge because then people know that they can trust you because you are held accountable and you hold others accountable. I think Kelly's, Kelly, go ahead. Um, I'm going to, based on our, our new vision statement, uh, one of my values is I, I believe that everybody should have an equal opportunity um, to reach their full potential in life. And our, our mission statement is a building a community where everyone has the opportunity to grow, thrive, and prosper and realize their full potential. Beautiful. Um, one of our lines in our coalition's vision statement is about um, providing a community where our youth feel empowered and building that resiliency. And that's one thing that I really uh, build into everyday life is empowering not just our youth, but everyone to feel resilient in the things they're doing. Love that. When you give people choices, and help them recognize that they have the power to shape their own future. I love that. Um, does anybody else want to share? What are your, your values that align with your, your organization? I'll share mine. Um, our, our mission statement starts with a safe and supportive community for youth and families. And you guys all saw my lovely assistant at the beginning of the uh, webinar. He is one of my my main passions and my reason that I like, I want him to grow up in a safe community. I want the best for him and for every other kid here. Thank you. Um, I wanna respect everybody's time. Um, it is 5.30. Uh, I dropped a survey link in the chat box. If you have two minutes right now, it'll take you one to go through the survey and you then you can take your extra minute to just sit and, um, and soak in what we talked about tonight. Um, you don't have to do it right now. I will be sending an email with the resources that we shared tomorrow morning, along with this survey link, but I do appreciate that feedback. Um, I have been incorporating that into what we're doing. If you have not already put your email address in the chat box, please make sure you do that before we leave tonight so that we can make sure everybody who wants it gets that um, one and a half hours of McVap CEUs. So thank you, everybody. If you have other questions, reach out to me, reach out to Joel, and we'd love to continue to support you in this journey. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Take care.